Hello, my name is Talib Küçükcan at the TRT World Forum. Today we are going to talk about again Srebrenica, especially the international law aspects and the accountability. Actually, we are going to focus on the following questions. How international justice failed in Srebrenica? To discuss and to answer this question, we have a very able guest here, Sir Jeffrey Nice. Uh, uh, thank you for joining us, Sir Jeffrey Nice. Let me introduce you to my audience first, then we will continue our discussion. Sir Jeffrey Nice is a QC. He has practiced as a barrister since 1971. He worked at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, known as the ICTY, between 1988 and 2006. As we can see, he has a lot of experience in that area. And also he was involved in the International Criminal Court, actually, regarding the victims in Sudan, Kenya, Libya, Iran, Burma, North Korea, whose cases cannot get to any international court, but he was the voice of the voices in that sense. He works for several related NGOs and lectures and commentates in the media in various countries. So he's also a public intellectual, as we can see. Between 2009 and 2012, he was the vice chair of the Bar Standards Board, the body that regulates barristers. Again, thank you very much for joining us, Sir Jeffrey Nice. It's a pleasure to host you here. Uh, so you have a, a vast experience in the international law area, especially with regard to the protection of victims and how those uh, uh, perpetrators uh, are supposed to be brought to justice. So today we are uh, debating and focusing on the cases uh, related to this Repsenica. 25 years ago, as we all remember, sadly, a massacre took place. Uh, a great uh, tragedy uh, was experienced in Srebrenica. More than 8,000 people lost their lives. My question is, as we mark the 25th anniversary of the Srebrenica massacre, where some more than 8,000 Bosnian Muslims were slaughtered at the hands of Bosnian Serb forces, would you say that justice in international courtrooms, at least, had been served um, correction, I only started at the ICTY in 1998, not 1988. Has justice been served? The answer has to be yes, no, or yes in part, and substantially no. And th that simple answer re reflects probably the view of the most important surviving people of that massacre, the relations, the mothers, sisters, fathers, brothers, children of the 8,000 who were killed. And indeed, you'll see behind me a photograph by a famous uh, photographer from Sarajevo of one of the mothers of Srebrenica. And these victims have suffered for now 25 years, um, as, yes, uh, 95, 2000, whatever it is, yes, uh, 25 years. Um, for lack of sufficient knowledge of what actually happened. Many of them have gone to their natural deaths, not knowing what actually happened. And I think it's important to focus them on them in the beginning, because I understand informally that to begin with, they thought the ICTY was doing really well. They were pleased with what justice was bringing them. And if they were pleased and satisfied, then that must be a reflection that some justice was being done. I suspect their reaction has changed over time and may now be more in line with the disappointment that many professionals feel. If it's right that there's a disappointment, why? The answer is that there were some trials at the ICTY which dealt with Srebrenica and indeed the whole tragedy of the former Yugoslavia conflicts uh, satisfactorily, but not many did it satisfactorily and there has to be a reason for that. First, the reasons, in fact. First, there was not an adequate indictment policy for the wickedness of Srebrenica, and in particular, the role of Serbia and its president, Milosevic, was not adequately explored in enough indictments. Why that happened, it's hard to know. Was there international pressure leading to a limitation of the number of cases that would show Serbia proper's involvement, I can't say, but it is certainly consistent 
with there having been pressure that not enough was shown about Serbia. Of the rem sorry, it, that's fine. Uh, you continue, please. You were, we were talking it, about the reasons behind yes. the failure, and, and so, uh, and so that's one reason. An indictment policy wasn't quite satisfactory. But there's another and also very substantial reason, and that is that the best evidence was not necessarily provided to those of us prosecuting cases. Why not? Well, of course, Serbia itself would not provide evidence because in the system of justice, which puts people on trial, if you've got an interest to serve, you don't cooperate. Now, that may not be very appealing to your viewers, but that's actually the reality. So Serbia didn't cooperate. It didn't provide the documents it wanted. It provided documents only under great pressure. It kept bits back. It hid bits. But it wasn't only Serbia that didn't cooperate. And I'll just give you one example, a very important example, that relates to Milosevic. We knew that Milosevic had been in telephone contact with Mladic just a few days after Srebrenica happened. We also knew that there had been international um, uh, listening in of those telephone conversations, intercepts of those phone conversations, and therefore transcripts existed. So we tried to get those transcripts because they would have shown us what role Milosevic in Serbia had in the activities of Mladic down there in Srebrenica as the killing started. In fact, this, this particular phone call, of which we are completely certain because we have records from Milosevic speaking about the phone call uh, related to the time when um, Zhepa went down, the next enclave. The international community stopped me getting those intercepts. I made the application. A country that held them was about to have to answer to the judges why it hadn't got these documents, these intercepts. And a very powerful influence walked into the prosecutor's office, Mrs. Del Ponte, and told her that I had to withdraw that application. And so we still don't know whether, Mla whether Milosevic said to Mladic, comply with the international law, don't harm a hair on their heads, put them in buses and send them to a safe place for Muslims, or whether he said, and there's evidence to support this now, there's evidence available, or whether he said, go ahead, do what you like. Well, Sir Jeffrey, nice. Uh, these are, I think, very sad but important, in a sense, revelations to us, mm. because the uh, yes, I mean, Serbians uh, did have a lot of responsibility, but you know, the international community, especially those people who have the uh, interceptions, the information about this call, they also, I think, they have hidden the uh, evidence. But what we know, at least, I mean, uh, when you look at the results, when you look at what happened on the ground. I think one could assume that the, the, he ordered uh, uh, the slaughter of those people because you know thousands of people were killed. And also that happened uh, in the presence of a UN force there because there was a Dutch battalion who were supposed mm -hmm. to be protecting uh, the uh, civilians. What would you say about their role and their, uh, at least because you were the lead uh, prosecutor in, this, uh, in the Milosevic trial, did, did you ask them or did you uh, ask for any evidence from the uh, from the uh, UN uh, uh, force? Uh, what were their uh, uh, visions or the findings or the evidence that they, are, they have uh, provided? Well, we certainly called witnesses from the Dutch battalion, in particular Major Frank and later Colonel Frank. Um, we did not call the lead um, officer of the Dutch battalion. And as you and your viewers may well know, um, the Dutch have been held responsible for their failure to defend those people. The Dutch have been held responsible for such horrifying things as have been evidenced many times by a man called Hassan Hanovic, who was one of the interpreters working within the compound for the UN, i.e. for the Dutch. And uh, his father and his brother were with him, and uh, the authorities from Holland said to Hassan Hanovic, you must send your brother and father out of the compound. We will not protect them. We'll protect you as a UN employee. We'll protect no one else. And of course, he has never seen his father and brother 
again. So the Dutch have picked up a huge reputational um, bad name for what they did. But it's rather interesting if you go to documents comparatively recently released for no very clear reason from the Clinton Library, and they're only a part of the overall records, it is quite clear that a few days before this happened, um, America and France and England, possibly Germany, I can't now remember that particular detail, made an agreement that despite the promise to the Dutch that they would provide air support for them, they made an agreement not to do so. And it's described in documents that uh, were produced by the uh, security advisor to Clinton, a man called uh, Sandy Berger, who died at the beginning of last year, but who's been interviewed on tape about this. The documents uh, show that there was what was called a quiet agreement, i.e. the Dutch were not told. The Dutch expected support, it didn't come. That might have saved, I suppose, all or some of the lives. And in the assessment of the international community, recorded in these very papers, is the phrase humanitarian nightmare. So the West knew that there was going to be a humanitarian nightmare. It is highly probable that they passed information to Mladic. And there's reason to believe who it was who passed that information because there was a meeting between Mladic and Milosevic just a couple of days before in the presence of a very senior Western diplomat. They passed information, things happened, there was going to be no air support or other support. And so Mladic knew, he never had to look up to the skies to fear the planes. He knew he could do what he liked. So that means there was, in a sense, a green light, yep. green light that he could, uh, you know, continue his massacres and then he mm. could get away with it. But, yeah. you know, given the number of people who were prosecuted and also sentenced, I think it is less than 100 people, as far mm -hmm. as I know. What does that tell us? I mean, when you talk about such a great massacre, I mean, uh, and also criminals, uh, uh, perpetrators, uh, do you think this is just a symbolic uh, number of people who were, were prosecuted or just to please the you know, public opinion in the, both in Srebrenica, in, in Bosnia-Herzegovina or in, uh, you know, globally? I mean, uh, if you look at the volume and the gravity of the problem and the uh, crimes, only less than 100 people were sentenced. What does it tell us? <laughs> there are two, two sides to the answer, aren't there? One, you, in, in a war, you're never going to be able to prosecute uh, investigate and prosecute everyone. It's an impossible task. It's an impossibility that maybe suggests other mechanisms such as truth commissions would be preferable, but that was never going to be possible in this particular setting. So you can't prosecute everyone. Those who were selected for prosecution and found to be available, eventually handed over for trial, were tried for some, but not necessarily all the matters that should have been laid against them. I've referred already to the indictment policy, and that policy was not in my hands. That policy was in the hands of others. And it certainly looks as though either the Serbs were just lucky or the policy was aimed at helping them in that, apart from Milosevic, no one was charged with genocide in respect of the, li the liability of Serbia proper itself. It was always kept very close, narrow, to the Bosnian Serbs, apart from Milosevic, and to a limited extent, one or two of the generals. So, it, you asked me at the beginning, was justice served? Yes, to an extent, there were some trials, the results were probably perfectly satisfactory, although I've got one thing to say about that in a minute. Um, were enough people brought to the book? Probably not. Why weren't they brought to book? Maybe it was never possible. Maybe there were other influences. But, you know, uh, Professor Kuchu Yan, there's a very important additional point to make when you ask the question about justice. Some of these trials lasted 10 years. Absurd. Quite a long time. Quite a no, long it's a, time. It's not I a know. long time. Right. It's an absurdly long period of time. 
because the people who are represented in the photograph behind me are the people for whom you have to have concern. People whose mothers, brothers, and so on had been killed, slaughtered, and who wanted to know the truth, and who had no chance of learning the truth by this completely slow juggernaut that was winding its way along a complicated... Why? Partly because the system of trial used was um, the Western system, the American system, English system. No justification for that. It was just chosen. It wasn't the best system. Also because judges were allowed to take their time. For example, the Sheshel judge, the French judge, Antonetti, who presided over the Sheshel case, a very important case, 10 years. What sort of justice is that? It isn't. And what you, sh you and your viewers should know is that if you look around and you say, let's forget about the law just for the time being, let's think about journalists. In the autumn of 1995, so just a few months after uh, the terrible events at Srebrenica, the New York Times could publish a four-page spread. Nearly all the details were correct. There's something very unjust in tethering and tying ourselves to a system that can be this slow and allow this passage of time before people know anything about the truth that happened. I think those things, the results or at least the procedure and the uh, uh, delivering justice in such a long time probably uh, led people to lose their trust and confidence in many international organizations yes. and international law. That is a sad thing. It seems that we did not learn any lessons from it, but I'll come to that at the end of our discussion. Now, I would like to talk about political repercussions of these uh, court cases, because you were the lead prosecutor in the Slobodan Milosevic case, but he died before the, I think, verdict delivered. Mm. Uh, in 2007, the International Court of uh, Justice found him guilty of failing to prevent genocide, but not of giving the orders, as you have said, because there was not, mm. I think, enough evidence, although it was there somewhere, but it was hidden from you. What do you think of that verdict, and what were its political repercussions? You and mean also, the 2000, I, I, Yes, yeah, the, 2007. The 2007 and, verdict. Yeah, yes, and also, of course, I would like you to comment on the um, uh, Peter Huntke case, who received Nobel Prize for Literature, but he was <laughs> supportive of uh, Milosevic. Well, I don't have, the, on the second point, I don't have very much to say about him that could be published and could be flattering. He was due to be a defense witness. Uh, he never, I think, turned up. Um, and um, I prefer to say nothing else about that. Many people have expressed a view on the appropriateness of his being given the Nobel Prize, and I'm not going to disagree with those negative views. Um, the 2007 decision of the International Court of Justice is really important. Your viewers should know that this is not a criminal case. This is a case in the world's highest court. It deals only with cases between states. And in that case, uh, which actually started uh, before Srebrenica, it was brought by Bosnia against Serbia, alleging breach of the Genocide Convention. Um, so it started in 1993. The, the decision has been widely regarded by many people as wholly unsatisfactory. The court, like many of these international courts, if not all of them, is regarded as, to a greater or lesser extent, political so that it may well be that it will make politically safe decisions or politically convenient decisions. And the does decision- that mean, Does it mean that the court was also politicized in a sense? Is that what you hinting at? I suppose it depends a bit what you mean by politicized, but does it, um, and I'm certainly not going to suggest, of course, that any member of the court is, is in any way corrupt but is the overall result of the court politi politicized, political, in that it reflects political interests? I think many people would say yes. And if you look at this particular decision, which allowed for uh, the minimum possible finding of genocide uh, against the Serbian state on a few days in July 1995, 
it was minimum possible because there were already decisions from the International Court of uh, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia with which it had to be in alignment. It couldn't completely overrule that in a sense, although it would be in conflict, it wouldn't overrule it. But the decision was regarded as in consequence as wholly unsatisfactory. And what the, the follow-on is even more unsatisfactory. It was always possible, uh, especially as our evidence became more available in, in the Yugoslav tribunal, the criminal tribunal, it was always possible that one could correct that judgment if, but only if, efforts were made and brought to an application to the court within 10 years, quite a long time. What happened in those 10 years and who had the responsibility for putting the record right? Well, the state of Bosnia did. Bosnia's constitution makes it, it, it almost impossible for it to make decisions because it's split between a Serb unit called Serb, a Republic of Srpska and then the Federation of Croats and Muslims. So nothing was done. But even that isn't bad, as bad as it gets. Right at the end of, 2000 and, uh, of 2016 and right into the beginning of 2017, a former guest of yours on this program, Dr. Trump and I were asked to try and make an application. Well, it was, of course, completely absurd to make such an application at that late stage. But nevertheless, because it, the work should have been done for the previous 10 years, there was a, a huge amount to be done. It could have been done. And we told them that. To cut a longish story short, that is tragic and funny in parts, we discovered that this was an insincere application by the Bosnian government's president, as he ultimately effectively confessed. It was made in order to make it look as though he'd tried to create a proper record for his people, whereas That's for whatever reason, he had no intention of doing so. And so the application that was bound to fail did fail. And since this is a public television program, there's something that I need to make quite clear. There's a man called David Sheffer, an American, and he's a, got a very good reputation to, by all appearances. He's been an ambassador for war crimes and similar. He was prevailed upon to draft an application which was so structured as to be bound to fail and it did fail within weeks or even days, I can't remember. It has never been made public. The Bosnian people do not know on what terms the last ditch effort was made by President uh, Bakir Izetbegovic to save, um, to, to set out a proper history. And I so now, so. Justice, so, sorry. After you. I, I, that's that's uh, also, I think, new revelation uh, to us. Here, there, there is a technical question that I want to ask because we were talking about the uh, dates and years. In 2017, ICTY was dissolved. Hmm. What was the reason behind it? I and mean, who took that decision? Who asked for that kind of a, uh, ending? I would say, I really, I'm honestly, I, I don't know much about this process, especially this technical uh, issue, but, but I think our viewers will be interested in hearing. Your, your uh, I don't know. I don't. I can't remember that much about it. I was long out of it myself by eleven years. Um, it was always going to end at some stage. It couldn't go on forever. It was hugely expensive, which is why such a, such a tribunal is unlikely ever to be established again. But obviously, there came a time when it had to be ended, and I, I can't remember now whether it was the UN that decided that would be the end of the trials. It, it must have been the UN, and and there's been there is a follow on mechanism which is bringing the trials that were already underway to a conclusion. It's called the mechanism. But right, okay. I, uh, I think you made some references, but I would like you to pick your brain on the following issue. Since the Nuremberg trials, mm. do you think have the mechanisms of international justice improved or regressed in your view? Because it was the first uh, and foremost, uh, I think, uh, trial 
uh, and still in the history of uh, international law we read about that uh, and also uh, the uh, universal ju jurisdiction there is yet another concept that maybe we should look at but my the first question i would say whether there has been improvement or uh, the other way around in terms of uh, delivering justice in the international uh, area well i i completely understand your question and only very recently have i come to the view that it's in a sense misconceived because you are su su suggesting that there was a continuity between Nuremberg and the uh, tribunal set up in 1993 and then the permanent international court and so on. And I think that probably there was, in a sense, no continuity. Of course, people were trying to get the international court. Some people were, but not the ordinary man and woman in the street. They didn't think of international justice. And the Nuremberg trials, although the results have, were, were very effective in what they did about the record of Nazi Germany, uh, many of the leadership were executed, others were tried, and so on. The trials were very, very flawed, very, very poor trials because they only tried one side of the conflict. They never considered the criminality of America with the atomic bombs uh, or in, in, in Japan, part of the, looking at the Tokyo trials, they never considered the British uh, bombing of places like Dresden, which might have ranked as war crimes. So they were very flawed. You can even find out if you dig not too deeply that, that evidence was obtained at gunpoint. <laughs> so they, they didn't exactly accord with modern standards. And then there's this huge period of time between 46, uh, 47 and 93, 50 or nearly 50 years when those of us who were worried about war didn't ask for people to be brought to trial, we waved placards saying, stop the war, that was, for example, the Vietnam War. And so it's probably better to think of the 1993 trials as a fresh start because everything was different about them. The people doing the trials had no connection with the territories themselves. Most of them had never been in a conflict. If you look at the Nuremberg trials, nearly everybody who had been in the conflict, had experience of it, were involved. You'll find people in uniforms in the court. So 1993 is a new start, and it's with new standards. And so I think the, the question is better cast as, starting in 1993, how's, how's it been? And this is both good and bad. If you see 1993 as a developing experiment, then a great deal has been done and tried in different settings and in different ways. Yugoslav, uh, Rwanda, then hybrid courts, mixed international and other ones in places like East Timor. Um, and then you've got the odd courts like the Lebanon. Then you've got the permanent courts. So a lot of efforts have been made. At the moment, uh, many of them were very successful. The, the Yugoslav tribunal, apart from the problematic cases, the famous problematic cases, did a lot of really good trials which brought in verdicts that are never going to be challenged. And, and a lot of law was discussed and so on and so forth. But there were also failings in them. The International Criminal Court ha has a very difficult first start, as many people know. And now, what's happened? Well, around the world, there is, amongst populist leaders, um, an increasing belief that there should not be an intervention by international organizations with the nation state. So America has tried actively to kill the International Criminal Court. What, do you th what, does, what should one think about that? And so the International Criminal Court is going to be starved of funds and may very well die Right, I think is great. Sorry. Yeah, I think uh, I agree with you that you are we are moving towards a little bit, you know, uh, destruction of multilateralism uh, and also, mm. uh, you know, there is a gro growing doubt about international organizations like UN also and international courts. This is unfortunate, of course. I mean, if we ask many leaders of the world, especially who have uh, experienced, uh, I think, political lives in Europe, they say. We are now living in an age, in an environment, as far as the political mood is uh, uh, developing, it is like, you know, just before the Second World War. Maybe this is very, very pessimistic, but when you look at the 
uh, I think the rise of populism and what's happening to the multilateralism and the ineffectiveness and the failures of the uh, uh, international organizations, I think there is some truth in this, in this claim. Anyway, uh, as part of that, I think, discussion, I just would like to ask you your personal view because you were one of the lead prosecutors and you also played a role in other uh, informal and informal uh, settings in tribunals. Do you think that uh, the international prosecutors became better equipped in dealing with cases of war crimes and crimes against humanity in recent years, or you are we are at the same you know stage? I mean, there is there has been a significant improvement to well, empower I, I, to empower yeah. the prosecutors. I would hope so, and I think that that if you see 1993 as a fresh start, not a continuum, and you see all those people as uh, bright-eyed and optimistic and doing their best, then even if some of the intervening processes have not been perfect, then the spirit is still there at the moment. And if the suppression has been by geopolitical forces, for example, America, but also other countries that uh, are deeply resistant to this type of intervention, then okay, there may not have been much product, may not have been much output, but the spirit may still be there. And it's very important to remember that it is only since 1993 that the citizens on the streets of Istanbul, London, Paris, Germany, Tokyo, Canberra, when they read of atrocities, now say, send them to a court to be tried. And as long as that spirit is there, we must say that there can be hope. And I think also, of course, with uh, whatever it is, 25 years or a bit more of experience, We've all got better, though I, don't, I no longer do these things in that way, but we've all got better at knowing how to prosecute cases. Further, if it weren't for the suppression by geopolitical forces, there is an increasing pressure and, on the citizen having the right to know. Documents should not be so easily suppressed by governments. They should be much more likely made available. And you only have to think of that again in respect to Srebrenica. If on the day that <laughs> Dayton, the accord that brought the, the Bosnian war to an end, the international community was allowed to walk into Serbia and open all the cupboards of government. Sir Jeffrey Nice. They could have, they could have brought the prosecution in days. It's be, a large problem has always been that governments and other bodies will keep information back and indeed lie to people. Sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah, I mean, uh, we are living in an age, I mean, this is not uh, the uh, spirit of this age, but it's been there always. I mean, we are living in a, in, a, in a world where there has been a lot of national competitions or regional competitions and political rivalries. Uh, therefore, I mean, the uh, international law has been, in a sense, influenced by this rivalry here and there. And sometimes, you know, the powerful countries have acted selectively when it comes to the victims, when it comes to the uh, accountability of some leaders, etc. So I think this is a reality. Spirit is there, but I think uh, people like yourself, I think have contributed to the rise of spirits. People will come uh, to the streets and demanding for justice, uh, I think, and that will put a lot of pressure on their national government. I think this is a huge improvement uh, in a sense. But I, I'd like to ask you whether we have uh, learned lessons from the atrocities in the past. And we talked about failures and shortcomings of the international mechanisms in bringing people to justice. Uh, therefore, it seems that in many places in the world, uh, some injustices uh, are taking place. Massacres are taking place. In Syria, uh, half a million people lost their lives. And also uh, in Myanmar, in some other places. Mm. And that continues. In Libya today, we have a conflict. In Yemen, I mean, you are... Uh, <laughs> an expert on those areas. You were involved on behalf of many innocent people to defend their rights. So when you look at from this perspective, do you think we have learned lessons from the past? Um, I, I really hope so. And it's being uh, interviewed by a chap like you on a program like this, that shows that the learning of lessons is not to be left simply to politicians. It is all of us who have to understand that crimes are committed in conflict that the victims are entitled to accountability and knowledge, to recognize that the international court system 
may either never work or may not work or will not work perfectly and may be very hard to improve. Therefore, we all owe a duty in different ways to uncover the truth, to provide the truth so that it can provide such comfort to victims, if comfort can ever be given, to which they are entitled, and to the rest of us, lessons about how we should conduct ourselves in a dangerous world. I am not pessimistic about that, providing everyone, not just lawyers and NGOs and people who say they do things about human rights, everyone learns I, the duty. I completely agree with you. I mean, individuals, groups, you know, social movements, uh, uh, political parties, states, I think the human rights should be defended by all, not by only, you know, uh, some segments of society. And if we can, of course, bring our forces together, it will be a more effective, I think, defense of the human rights. Now, I would like to, uh, we are running out of time, actually. We have got just a few minutes, uh, and we have got lots of issues to, to ask you. Hopefully, we can uh, come together again, but this time, so we plan for 40 minutes almost. Uh, my other question is to you about the current crises that are unfolding, you know, Libya, Yemen, Syria. The question is, what can be done, if anything, given the you know, uh, reality on the ground? What can be done, if anything, to deter further war crimes being committed in Libya and other countries? A couple of things. If, if, for geopolitical reasons, you can't get these countries to the International Criminal Court, or if the International Criminal Court dies, there are still uh, uni what's called universal jurisdiction um, laws in many countries, so that if you commit torture or if you commit genocide, uh, a country that has universal jurisdiction can try you for these things, regardless of whether you have any, you as, a, uh, as an individual, have any uh, particular connection to that country. And I haven't expressed that very well. But you can try somebody in England for genocide if he or she walks into your country, even though the genocide was committed in another country, and has no superficial connection to Great Britain. And so this is really important for people whose suffering is not going to be brought to the International Criminal Court or any other court that the UN will ever be willing to set up. And there are, there are ways in which you can attack either individuals if they find themselves other countries and they are shown to have been torturers or killers or whatever it may be, you can attack companies that, um, for example, provide materials to allow other countries to, to create concentration camps. Or indeed, as you know, the wall in uh, Israel that has been found to be unlawful. And therefore, there would be great concern in any Western country invited to provide uh, materials for the wall because it would be to do something that is unlawful. So there are these other local ways of uh, attack on the criminality. They're never going to be as dramatic as a full court hearing with verdicts um, and pictures of verdicts, but they may be in their own way very effective. There are many other mechanisms from people's inquiries of the kinds I've been involved in in respect of uh, forced organ harvesting in China uh, and also in, in respect of the suffering in Iran under the Ayatollahs in the 1980s or, or indeed going back even further, the Indonesian massacre of the opposition in 1965. Um, Myanmar is an example of imaginative thinking by... Um, uh, the Gambia, in a clever way of using the international law to everyone's surprise, bringing a case to the International Court of Justice, where that arguably political court will have to decide what its scope is. So the, the simple courts, criminal courts, with all the drama and all the slow speed, may not do as much as we would like them to do. There are plenty of other mechanisms and providing, to repeat your point and mine, that everyone does their bit, despite geopolitical 
pressures to stop this, justice for, for victims may improve. Thank you very much. Sir Jeffrey Nice, I would like to thank you on behalf of our audience and on behalf of the RT World Forum. I think that was a very insightful uh, interview with you. Thank you very much for sharing your ideas and your experience with us. And uh, to our audience, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we will continue to debate this Rebzenica issue tomorrow as well. Please join us tomorrow. Thank you.